Hello everyone, this is Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective of nutritionrestored.com and my new network at nutrition-restored.mn.co. What I'm gonna do today, I'm going over Chris Masterjohn and how I believe he is a case study in vitamin A toxicity, B1 deficiency, and some other things are going on based on his recent posting on Facebook. What I'm going to go over today is fully referenced. The link to this, the, the, the link to my article on this topic with all the reference links, the hyperlinks is going to be in the comments below this video. So you can find it because I always reference everything I do. I'm going to be reading some of the quotes from the papers that I'm referencing today to you. So this is going to be a decently long, not as long as my Facebook Live Q&As, but this will be a decently long presentation because I have to go over all the, the evidence. And when I go over evidence, I read the evidence to you. I don't just say, check the link. I want you to know that it's there and I'm not making it up. So first, I want to make people aware that my intention here is to help Chris so that he can potentially fix the numerous health issues that he's dealing with. If that's not possible, I want any of you who are watching this, hopefully you can look at what I'm presenting, look at the clues I'm putting together, and if any of this is going on for you, you can help yourself, or if you decide to, you can come and look at the stuff I've put together so that I can help you to help yourself. Myself, me, and others, Grant Jenneru, all the people in my vitamin A detox program, other people around the internet have started to realize that vitamin A is not a vitamin and it's actually a poison. In the past, some of us have approached Chris about this issue. He's taken to ad hominem attacks, character attacks on us, calling us things like flat earthers. He really didn't like it when I pointed out his aggressive replies on Facebook to be potentially linked to the, the papers on chronic aggression and vitamin A toxicity. And others have noted that any discussion of vitamin A toxicity on his Facebook pages is quickly deleted. Oh, well. I'm not going to, I don't know any of Chris's health history other than what he himself has put on the internet. The post he put on Facebook quite recently about his newer health issues and his now adventures in the conventional medical system to try to figure out the root cause of these issues is the one I'll mainly be discussing. I've heard from others about his admitted on the internet issues of things like exercise intolerance, heat intolerance, and allergies. And these are things that we regularly see improve on the vitamin A detox program that I have people doing. Just in case the post were to disappear, I have screenshots of his Facebook post in the article that's linked below. I'm going to read it to you here, and then I'll be going through it piece by piece as we go through the, the evidence and the research connecting this to the things I said it was connected to. So this is Chris Masterjohn's Facebook post. Quote, I went in for an MRI last night. I was nervous AF, we'll keep it safe for work and family here, about getting injected with gadolinium contrast, and you can probably tell the anxiety level is way higher in my before picture versus in, versus in the post-MRI beer pick. I'm investigating an abnormal gait that has crept up on me three times now. The first time was while I was on terbinafine in 2017 for a fungal infection. The second was in January or so of this year after I'd switched my main carbs from beans and veggies to butternut squash. This last time seemed to come up after I started tanning, which helps my eczema whenever it starts creeping up. The gait issue feels like I have to pick my legs up too high to move. My girlfriend noticed my left leg dragging too. Every time it happens, I adjust a few things and it goes away. The terbinafine also caused severe twitching, which I solved by getting enough potassium and avoiding alcohol and acids. 
As it subsided, it settled into a fuzzy paresthesia in my cheeks that got better and better over time. The last bout of twitching is highly effectively managed with strategies targeting acid-base balance and glutamate. Currently emphasizing beta alanine and B6, the gait issue seemed to resolve in response to ensuring adequate B vitamins across the board. By the time I went to the neurologist, the gait issue was 95% gone, but she thought me having a witness to the leg dragging compelling enough to do an MRI and EMG. If I find anything interesting, I'll be using it to probe whether I have any genetics that could offer a unified explanation for why veganism and terbinafine both seem to have caused neurological problems for me. Notably, my cholesterol is always low, currently 140 to 160. Veganism slashed it to 106, and terbinafine works by inhibiting fungal sterol synthesis and is 60% active against human cholesterol synthesis. When I have more info, I'll keep you up to date. End quote. Now this is mine. Now I'm talking. There is no good reason to downplay any of the signs or symptoms showing up in that post. Okay. He is far too young to be showing these significant neurological symptoms unless he potentially has some toxicity going on or he's severely deficient in something else. Could it be multiple toxicities? Possibly. Could it be multiple deficiencies? Possibly. There are evidence and arguments for both, and they both go together, as you shall see. In this article, I'm going to lay out the science that shows that Chris likely has a severe and worsening chronic vitamin A toxicity problem, severe B vitamin deficiency, particularly in thiamine B1, and both of those issues are being exacerbated by continued alcohol consumption, as he admitted in the post. I'm not going to repost any of the posts associated pictures because I think what we're talking about is enough. I did note that in two of the three associated pictures with that Facebook post, he was holding a beer. And in the, in the post he talks about, and another post, he talks about four drinks in one night while the picture is yet of another beer. I don't care how much somebody drinks. What I care about is how, the, how it affects the body system and plays into the clues that his case is leaving here for me. The nutrition detective, that's what I look at clues. That's what I do. You'll see the reason for that term as we go through this piece by piece. Important things to keep in mind as we go on from this part are that alcohol has extremely negative interactions with vitamin A, and that alcohol severely depletes thiamine among other B vitamins. So does vitamin A and we will cover these all below. Chris Masterjohn is well known in the nutritional circles of the internet as being a sort of uh, super fan and subject matter expert on nutrition for the Weston A. Price Foundation. They generally advocate consuming massive amounts of food-based vitamin A, and then even in terms of supplements like cod liver oil, fermented cod liver oil, rotten cod liver oil, and uh, rancid cod liver oil, and things like liver pills, organ meat pills. So they're, they're even supplementing with high vitamin A foods in supplement form. They incorrectly, completely incorrectly, believe that vitamin A from foods is not toxic. I have presented tons of evidence showing that liver can induce vitamin A toxicity. Carrots can induce vitamin A toxicity. I have a case study in this paper where a, a woman, a 20 year old woman, got toxic from eating vegetables, pumpkin, liver, and laver, which is a type of seaweed, which a lot of people think is a health food too, which I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. They are wrong based on the science. And I have plenty of their ex followers who attest to their vitamin A toxicity from foods. And they are paying for it, and their children are often paying for it. If you did this high vitamin A food approach or supplement approach, and your children are not right either, whether you did it in pregnancy or afterwards, I can help. We can help this problem. It does not just go away. It has to be purposely dealt with. So it should also be known that on Chris's website, he promotes discounts and thus likely has financial arrangements with 
at least two companies that sell organ meat products in various forms. Why is this important? Well, there's the old saying, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Quite applicable here. I have some of the titles of his articles that he's written over at the Weston A. Price Foundation website showing an extreme pro-vitamin A bias. We have vitamin A, the forgotten bodybuilding nutrient. We have vitamin A on trial. Does vitamin A cause osteoporosis? Yes, it does. Yes, yes. 5,000 units or more a day. Yes. Food or supplement, doesn't matter. In that article, in that article I just mentioned, vitamin A on trial, does vitamin A cause osteoporosis? You can get a real feel for his downplaying chronic vitamin A toxicity from the title of a, a section in there. The title is, how much vitamin A is too much? The wrong question to ask. And I'm gonna say that asking too much of something, how much is too much, is actually the most important question you could ask. And he gave an update on vitamins A and D. Also, who can forget the article and video he did on his own website about how he somehow got vitamin A deficient in less than one month of vacation, which is impossible for anyone to do. Anyone who has ever watched vitamin A tests, which I'm becoming kind of the person who's seen the most vitamin A tests, I believe, going around, no one gets deficient in a month. We know that his diet is vitamin A heavy, and I'll go over his diet that he's posted before later, and you'll see that there is no deficiency of vitamin A in his regular diet. And vitamin A is fat soluble, which means it's stored in the liver and the tissues of the body, especially the body fat. 20% of your vitamin A is in your body fat. And Medscape, pretty legit source, right? Medscape says, quote, an adult liver can store up to a year's reserve of vitamin A. So a heavy consumer of vitamin A should have no deficiency that would show up in a month of a, of a low vitamin A diet or even a no vitamin A diet. Scientists are always confused. I can tell you from the research that they're always confused that vitamin A, when people stop eating vitamin A, they don't see the serum retinol level drop for one to two years sometimes, up to two years. So a deficiency did not happen in a month. And one of the things he talks about in that video is he started supplementing more vitamin A on top of his already vitamin A heavy diet. What likely happened, in my opinion, and from what I've seen in people doing the vitamin A detox, is that when he stopped eating so much vitamin A, when you're eating a lot of something, a, a toxin, your body stops detoxing it because you can't detox and intox at the same time. That would double or, you know, that would heavily increase the amount that's in your blood, which would heavily increase the symptoms you might feel in your heart and your brain. So your body says, if we have a lot of something coming in, we're going to stop detoxing it so much. And the opposite is true. When you stop bringing in so much of a poison, this is, what, this is why people do detoxes, right? They stop taking in the poison so that then their body can shift into getting rid of it. So what happened is Chris, on his vitamin A heavy diet, he went on a low vitamin A diet for a while and his body shifted into detox mode of what I believe is a poison. And then he, then he started shoving in a bunch of vitamin A and his symptoms went away because he stopped the detox. One tip, go read the comments on that linked article of his, and you'll see multiple people talking about vitamin A toxicity there, and not a lot of helpful advice. So, what if we had insight into Chris's diet? Would that tell us something? We do, and I have it linked. He did an interview about what he thought the ideal diet was and what his diet actually was. I'm only gonna cover the parts that are Per, per, pertinent to vitamin A toxicity here. Excerpts from the section called Chris's Guide to the Ideal Diet. Diversify your source of protein, meat, fish, poultry, shellfish, eggs, 
dairy, etc. Diversify within the animal. Make an effort to eat nose to tail. That means organ meat. Add four to eight ounces of liver to your diet each week. Replace some meat with heart, or if you're feeling more adventurous, try kidney. Consume a large volume of vegetables, several cups per day. Diversify across the colors, green, red, orange, yellow. So all of those things I did this for, those are all high sources of vitamin A. Organ meats are some of the highest sources of vitamin A. And he's advocating to purposely eat lots of organ meats and to eat up to a half a pound of liver a week. And then red and orange and yellow vegetables. Generally, there, there are some fruits that are not really high in vitamin A that can be red, like strawberries and raspberries and things of that nature. But if you're in the vegetable area, if it's red, it's generally vitamin A, red. And orange and yellow are the main colors of vitamin A carotenoids. So that's a high vitamin A diet. Then we have excerpts from the section called Chris Master John's Actual Diet. And again, I'm only talking about the vitamin A related parts here. His diet is modified due to digestive issues and not being able to absorb fructose well. Chris's typical meal, white rice, a lot of mixed vegetables, meat or eggs, a tomato product, usually salsa, which has peppers in it too, one tablespoon of unfortified nutritional yeast. That's important. Chris will take oyster extract and liver supplements throughout the day. His main fruit is bell pepper and he tries to eat all the colors. I'm going to spend some time on this part. Again, every time I put that finger up, those are high vitamin A things that you need to pay attention to or they affect the metabolism of vitamin A based on the research in the body. Note the part about not being able to metabolize fructose well. Research has shown in rats that vitamin A toxicity, hypervitaminosis A, slows down a key enzyme directly involved in fructose metabolism. Studies called early effects of hypervitaminosis A on gluconeogenic activity and amino acid metabolizing enzymes of rat liver. Here's the quote from the study. Furthermore, hypervitaminosis A decreased the activities of two key hepatic glycolytic enzymes, phosphofructokinase and pyruvate kinase, without affecting those of hexokinase and glucokinase, end quote. Probably not a coincidence. Liver pills, and oyster extract are both concentrated sources of supplemental vitamin A. There is no difference between supplement vitamin A and natural vitamin A. Forget that. Research doesn't show that at all. Tomatoes and bell peppers, besides being in the inflammatory nightshade family, which is actually a topic that I presented at the Weston A. Price Convention on, um, they're both really high in vitamin A carotenoids. Okay. And vegetables, lots of vegetables, especially in the red, yellow, and orange color spectrum, will always be high sources of vitamin A. We kind of went over that before. So we got a high vitamin A diet with vitamin A supp extracted supplements in there too. Here is the kicker though. A study from the 1950s showed that rats who were given yeast or any fraction of liver, water-soluble fractions or fat-soluble fractions, along with vitamin A, got much worse symptoms of vitamin A toxicity than rats who were only given the vitamin A. This is like a synergistic toxicity. He was eating yeast with every meal, a tablespoon of yeast with every meal. 
liver pills with every meal. So you take all the vitamin A he was eating and you add those to it. And the study from the 50s showed that more vitamin A toxicity symptoms will happen with the same consumption of vitamin A rather than if it was just the foods by themselves without those liver and um, yeast. Okay. There was also notably in that paper, they talked about tuna solubles worsening this problem. They talked about fish solubles worsening this problem and acetone extracted herring roe. An extract huh. also worsened the vitamin A toxicity problem. So we have tuna, fish, roe, fish roe, fish eggs. Those all worsen the vitamin A toxicity problem. Is it that far of a leap to think that maybe that oyster extract is worsening the problem? It's not too far for me to jump to. Besides the oysters already high in vitamin A. Chris says that this is his regular daily diet. Quite high in vitamin A with two or possibly three other factors in it that are worsening, potentially worsening his vitamin A toxicity symptoms. So now that we've gone through all that, now we're gonna go into the Facebook post piece by piece. I'll talk about the quotes from his post and then I'll talk about my comments after. Quote, I went in for an MRI last night. I was nervous AF about getting injected with gadolinium contrast and you can probably tell the anxiety level is way higher in my before picture versus in the post MRI beer pic. Okay, I wanna to get to the end quote. I wanna to get to the bigger things first. I will revisit the anxiety below after painting the bigger picture. Quote from Chris, I'm investigating an abnormal gait that has crept up on me three times now, end quote. A recurring or repeating issue that could easily imply that either it's a toxicity state that continues to return or a deficiency state that continues to return or a combination of both. He's addressed it nutritionally before, taking out toxic things like alcohol and adding in nutrients like B vitamins. I'm gonna tell you that one thing about vitamin A toxicity is that it, if, if it is not dealt with, it continually gets worse and the solutions that used to work stop working. The toxicity always wins in the end for anything, mercury toxicity, anything else. It always wins in the end. You should be able to figure out for yourself that if it continues to recur, the root cause of the problem has not been dealt with. That should make sense. It's only been symptomatically addressed or as he said in one part, managed. Is abnormal gait a known symptom of chronic vitamin A toxicity? Yes, it is, and across multiple different species at that. In cats, here's the title of the paper, skeletal abnormalities in the hind limbs of young cats as a result of hypervitaminosis A. Side note, how do cats get hypervitaminosis A? From people who feed them too much liver. You can see it in the research. Okay, quote from that paper, hypervitaminosis A causes extensive confluent exostosis formation of the cervical spine in adult cats. It was initially reported that no juvenile osteodystrophy occurred in this disease, but an abnormal hindquarter gait was described later in a group of young cats receiving large daily doses of vitamin A. No explanation of this abnormal gait was given and the condition was therefore studied further. Now we get to add in pigs and humans. So this is from a paper called Hypervitaminosis A in the Pig. So they're talking about pigs. Premature, oh, sorry, quote, premature closure of epiphyseal cartridges, cartilages and changes in the structure of epiphyses themselves gave rise to joints of abnormal structure, direction, and amplitude of movement leading to lameness and gait changes. This has been amply demonstrated in experimental hypervitaminosis A of young cats and 
also in children recovering from hypervitaminosis A, 1962. End quote. Amply demonstrated. I think that's a strong enough wording from a 50 year old paper for my purposes here. Now we're going to head into thiamine B1. So if you hear me say thiamine, I mean B1. And if I say B1, I mean thiamine. There's different types of them, but I'm talking about the vitamin. Has thiamine deficiency ever been associated with abnormal gait? Yes. It has been associated so much so with thiamine deficiency that there is a specific name for the neurological triad of disease symptoms that show up in severe thiamine deficiency from a link called thiamine deficiency. The classic Wernicke encephalopathy triad of ocular abnormalities, gait ataxia, and mental status changes is frequently seen. End quote. Remember the term gait ataxia. It will come up again later. Quote from Chris again. The first time was while I was on terbinafine in 2017 for a fungal infection, end quote. The start of a problem is always a very important point. That's the start of a case, right? Terbinafine is an antifungal medication that has a known reputation for being extremely hepatotoxic or liver toxic. The liver happens to be the main metabolism area location for breakdown or detoxification of vitamin A. This is a given. It's also where vitamin A is stored. And it's also why people have always known that it's toxic. Why they'd say that eating liver, you're eating like a poisonous organ and it's where all the toxins are stored. Chris himself has said that the liver doesn't store toxins. Well, what does the liver store? Vitamin A. Why would people who before vitamin A even existed know that the liver was toxic? Hmm? They knew something was in there. They didn't know what it was, but they knew that in, up in the Inuit area, they knew that eating polar bear liver could make you go nuts and possibly die. Gosh, doesn't sound like any toxins stored in liver to me, does it? So if you damage the liver, you damage everything. I have an article that I linked in the, in the article. I wrote a separate article that's linked in the article about how other antifungal medications are known to inhibit the breakdown or detoxification of vitamin A, and this is in the literature. So we know he, it's an antifungal medication, and we know that other antifungal medications have been shown to stop the breakdown detox of vitamin A. So is it possible that terbinafine does this? It's known that terbinafine causes liver damage. It's known that vitamin A toxicity causes liver damage. Could they be connected? Sure. Why not? It may not be in the research yet. Doesn't mean they couldn't be there. They just haven't studied it yet. But we also need to connect something else very important here. You will want to listen and or look at the post that I wrote very carefully. First, you must know this. Some of any and all of the carotenoids, plant vitamin A, retinol, animal vitamin A, and retinyl esters, which is the animal storage form of vitamin A. Some of all of that that somebody consumes or whether you absorb it through your skin, your cosmetics, is turned into something called 13-cis-retinoic acid. This is not a debate. Some people say that 13-cis-retinoic acid is one of the active forms of vitamin A. If you believe that, then that's, when you, if you take cod liver oil or retinyl palmitate supplements, what you're really after, if you believe that vitamin A is something you need, is for it to turn into, some of it to turn into 13 cis retinoic acid. So this is not a debate, okay? Here's something you might not know about 13 cis retinoic acid and, and your body making it 
out of other things. 13 cis retinoic acid is also sold to people in a pill form by pharmaceutical companies. They call it isotretinoin, or more familiar, familiarly to people, Accutane or Roaccutane. You might be going, oh, whoa, what? 13 cis retinoic acid is another name for Accutane, and I make that in my body? Yeah. There is no difference between the 13 cis retinoic acid that you take in an Accutane, you could take in an Accutane pill, and the 13 cis retinoic acid that your body makes from eating or ingesting carotenoids, beta carotene, or retinol, retinol esters, vitamin A. No difference. You're welcome to try to argue. Please take your arguments to the chemists and the biochemists, the experts in analyzing things like this, for your argument. Don't argue with me because they say it's the same. Their analysis shows it's the same. You get to argue with chemists and biochemists who know a lot more about this than you do. They don't have a thing on their, on their mass spectrometer that says, well, this is natural 13 cis retinoic acid and this is synthetic 13 cis retinoic acid. It doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. They're the same thing. Your body turns some of the vitamin A that you eat into Accutane. Gosh. It starts to make you look differently at vitamin A toxicity, doesn't it? Do you know about the toxicity of Accutane? You know that 600 people a year die from Accutane? But your body makes it. Do you want your body making Accutane? I don't. So why is this 13 cis retinoic acid so important? Remember, another name for 13 cis retinoic acid is isotretinoin. That's the generic drug name of it. It's important because 13 cis retinoic acid, isotretinoin, and terbinafin have a known drug drug interaction that is extremely pertinent here. In the article, I can't give you a direct link to this, the, the, the screen. The, I need to show you a screenshot from it because you can't reproduce the exact thing you see on the screen unless you give a screenshot. So the screenshot's in my article. I tell you how to go find it for yourself to look it up for yourself. If there's one thing I want you to do is to be able to find the stuff that I'm talking about, be backed up. Here's what that link says. It's from drugbank.ca is the main website. It says that terbinafine has an interaction with isotretinoin, which is 13 cis retinoic acid. They interact such that the risk or severity of myopathy Rhabdomyolysis and myoglobinuria can be increased when terbinafine is combined with isotretinoin. Myopathy means diseases of muscles. What do you use when you walk? Muscles. Therefore, because some portion of all the vitamin A that a person consumes turns into 13 cis retinoic acid, it can be assumed that an excess of vitamin A in the system would lead to an excess of 13 cis retinoic acid. And that 13 cis retinoic acid, AKA isotretinoin, could or would interact with terbinafine in the manner described above. That's not good, right? Keep the myopathy part in mind because I'll come back to that later. Another quote from Chris, Chris's post. The second time, was in January or so of this year after I'd switched my main carbs from beans and veggies to butternut squash. It doesn't get any more obvious than this, folks. Switched from beans and veggies to butternut squash. Lots of butternut squash would have lots of what in it? Some of you know. Switching from beans and veggies to butternut squash, which is a type of winter squash, would drastically increase his vitamin A carotenoids intake. Just how high is butternut squash in vitamin A? Well, this is from the, the winter squash entry at whfoods.com, worldshealthiestfoods.com. They have a lot of good nutritional 
statistic information. I'm not so sure about their recommendations, but they have a lot of, they, they show a lot of the USDA nutrition, nutrient information for foods that I find easy to access. So that's why I use this. I am not endorsing their, their diet recommendations. So anyway, from that site, quote, the vivid orange flesh of many winter squash varieties is due to their amazing concentration of carotenoids. Among these carotenoids are beta carotene, alpha carotene, and other carotenoids that can be converted into active forms of vitamin A called retinoids. At WH Foods, winter squash actually makes its way into our top 10 sources of vitamin A due to its carotenoid richness. In fact, among all 100 of our WH Foods, only sweet potato, carrot, and the green leafy vegetables surpass winter squash in terms of their total carotenoid content, end quote. Top 10 sources of vitamin A, huh? A great way to get toxicity or to worsen toxicity would be to eat one of the foods highest in the toxin, would it not? Can one get toxic from food sources of carotenoids and retinoids? Some of you still out there believe in the appeal to nature fallacy that somehow food vitamin A is innocent and cannot hurt you. No matter how much of it you eat, you are dead wrong. No pun intended there, because it, it, yeah, it's not fun. So remember that foods can cause vitamin A toxicity. When I read the below case study, and remember that pumpkin that they talk about is a type of winter squash. Here's the title of that paper. Vitamin A toxicity secondary to excessive intake of yellow green vegetables, liver, and laver, which is a type of seaweed. Quote, a 20 year old Japanese woman had been eating pumpkin and only a very limited amount of other foods on a daily basis for two years. She was overly concerned about weight reduction. Orantiasis cutis and abnormal liver function tests were noted by her family doctor in 1995 when she was 18 years old. At that time, she stopped eating pumpkin. However, she secretly continued an excessive intake of other beta carotene rich vegetables, liver, and labor for about two years. Two and one half years after being seen by her family physician, she experienced sudden onset of low grade fever, limb edema, chelitis, dry skin, and headache. These symptoms worsened daily. A liver needle biopsy was performed and it showed a normal portal tract along with fat laden ETO cells in the space of dis. A final diagnosis of vitamin A poisoning and hepatic injury secondary to an eating disorder was made. End quote. Now, I have other papers like this too. Carrot Man is a good one. Carrot Man, he was, he was juicing about a pound of carrots a day and he got diagnosed with vitamin A retinol toxicity. Can you get vitamin A toxic from vegetables? Yes. Can you get toxic from eating liver? Oh my gosh, yes. I have about, I think, 12 different species of liver that people have eaten that have caused vitamin A toxicity. Fish liver, pork liver, bear liver, sled dog liver, cow liver, pig, yeah, I said pig liver. Yeah, it's all, it's all there. It's, the vitamin A is stored in the liver. You eat liver, you are eating stored vitamin A. And it has caused toxicity over and over and over again. So much so that the government of Finland warned pregnant women and their children under one year of age to completely avoid liver-containing products like liver and pate, liver pate. A government warned women and young children to avoid eating it completely. Do you think they did that on a whim? Do you think it's because they've never seen liver cause toxicity in vitamin A? You, you're taking a risk if you decide not to believe them. So please stop with the food-based vitamin A simply can't cause toxicity trope because it's, it's old 
it's delusional and it does not fit in line with what the science says. Now, one other thing about this little situation with the switching from beans and veggies to butternut squash. Regularly consuming beans or legumes is a pretty solid approach to getting adequate dietary thiamine, B1. It doesn't work so well for everybody's digestion though. You remember how I talked about thiamine deficiency and abnormal gait previously? The switch that Chris did from beans and veggies to butternut squash did two main things. It drastically increased his vitamin A intake while it drastically decreased his thiamine intake. That's a double move in the wrong direction for his gait. The gait problem came back. Note how I've linked gait problems to both vitamin A toxicity and thiamine deficiency above. There aren't any coincidences, folks. There are no coincidences. Now, next quote from Chris. This last time, it seemed to come up after I started tanning, which helps my eczema whenever it starts creeping up. End quote. First, is eczema a symptom of vitamin A toxicity? Yes. From safety assessment, including current and emerging issues in toxicologic pathology in the section called excess. Quote, the toxicity of vitamin A, hypervitaminosis A, is manifested in two forms, acute and chronic. And then we skip forward to the next part. Toxicity at the cellular level is manifested by redifferentiation of simple types of epithelium into more complex forms, including mucous epithelium. Accompanying this is decreased cohesion between epithelial cells in the skin. Accordingly, most affected humans report skin changes such as pruritus, itching, erythema, eczema, and dermatitis with bleeding and cracking of the skin, especially around lips and gums, as well as hair loss and nose bleeds, end quote. So eczema is linked to vitamin A toxicity. If also now onto the tanning part, if one was vitamin A toxic, this would mean that they have excess vitamin A stored pretty much everywhere, including in the skin, which has been shown to convert carotenoids into retinyl esters, by the way. So it's not just your liver that converts carotenoids. It has been shown that the skin converts carotenoids into retinyl esters, which is the storage form, which is then returned to your liver to be stored. So just because people say, well, the liver doesn't convert that much, the skin does. How do you think the, uh, when people get hyperkeratinemia, when they get orange skin from eating too many orange, yellow, vitamin A vegetables, how do you think that goes away? They convert the carotenoids, they break that down into retinaldehyde and retinyl esters, which then goes to be stored other places. But it leaves the skin, so your skin looks less orangish yellow, okay? It didn't just go away. It went back into the blood. So if they were vitamin A toxic, they would have it everywhere, including in the skin and in the subcutaneous under the skin fat. What happens when too much ultraviolet light, like sunlight or tanning, is applied to an excess of vitamin A in the skin? It's not good. From the paper, Photo decomposition of vitamin A and photobiological implications for the skin. Quote, the biological effects of light-induced degradation of vitamin A and formation of reactive species are less understood and may be important for light-exposed tissues such as the skin. Photochemical studies have demonstrated that excitation of retinol or its esters with UV light generates a number of reactive species, including singlet oxygen and superoxide radical anion. These reactive oxygen species have been shown to damage a number of cellular targets, including lipids and DNA. Consistent with the potential for damaging DNA, retinyl palmitate, a retinyl ester that's stored in the liver, has been shown to be photomutagenic in an in vitro test system. The results of mechanistic studies were consistent with mutagenesis through oxidative damage. 
end quote. Apparently, exposing vitamin A to light in the skin, or UV, tanning, creates all sorts of toxic DNA damaging, which is what mutagenic means, byproducts. I've written a whole article that's linked about how sun poisoning and sun allergy are simply the result of vitamin A toxicity in the skin. And when you get too, so it's good to get sun because it helps break down the vitamin A in your skin. That's good. Sun or UV tan beds, they can both work for this purpose. It helps break down the vitamin A in your skin to get rid of it. This is why people who you know, are generally healthier who live in areas where there's lots of sun. The problem is, is if you do it too much or you're too toxic, too much or too toxic, and you get too much UV light, whether it's sun or tanning beds, you feel like hot garbage because it creates too many of these toxic things. So when Chris was stirring up toxic, toxic byproducts of vitamin A, oxidized vitamin A, like if vitamin A is bad, oxidized vitamin A is even worse. He induced DNA mutations, damage to oxidative damage to lipids, all sorts of nastiness, and his gait got worse. Okay. Now, does light exposure, UV light exposure or sun exposure, do anything to deplete thiamine or any other nutrients? Yeah, it does. Here's the title of the paper, Exposure to Sun Rays, an Investigation of Serum Micronutrient Status in Wistar Rats. Quote, of all the micronutrients measured only thiamine, vitamin A, and pantothenic acid, as well as minerals such as zinc, manganese, and copper, were significantly lower in sun-exposed rats compared with control, the control rats, end quote. So we've talked about thiamine deficiency already here. If sun exposure depletes thiamine, it is likely that a tanning bed would too. Now, I, they mentioned vitamin A being going down in there. Yes, I, I do think sun and UV can help to get rid of vitamin A. But if, if you were in my detox program, you'd know that I consider sun what's called an agitator, which can mean that as it helps one to detox the vitamin A, it also can stir it up and make you feel worse. You're, you're detoxing too fast and creating too many toxic byproducts that are making you feel bad. That's an agitator. It's helping the process but it's also agitating it and making you feel worse. These are the type of concepts I go over in the vitamin A detox program. So if depleting thiamine is bad, I can tell you that depleting zinc, which was mentioned there, is probably just as bad. You need zinc to protect you from vitamin A. But I'm gonna leave that part alone because this is already going on way too long. So we're gonna stick to the vitamin A toxicity and the thiamine and some of the other B vitamins as we'll get to in a second. So am I surprised that Chris had a reaction in terms of his eczema based on tanning, knowing what we know about his potential vitamin A toxicity status? No, it completely fits with what I've seen. Next quote from Chris. The gate issue Feels like I have to pick my legs up too high to move. My girlfriend noticed my left leg dragging too. Do you remember the myopathy part from the terbinafine plus isotretinoin that we already talked about? What is the primary symptom of myopathy? Well, from a government myopathy information page. The myop quote, the myopathies are neuromuscular disorders in which the primary symptom is muscle weakness due to dysfunction of muscle fiber, end quote. So that's myopathy. Do you remember gait ataxia that we talked about above? What is that defined as? Well, ataxia from the Mayo Clinic, they define it as, quote, 
Ataxia describes a lack of muscle control or coordination of voluntary movements such as walking or picking up objects. End quote. So is Chris's leg lifting problem due to weakness, myopathy, or a lack of muscle control or coordination, ataxia? We'll probably never know. And the bigger question is, if we know what's causing the problem and we know how to fix it, at least I know how to fix it, does figuring out which one it is really matter at all? I'm going to say it doesn't because we see things on the vitamin A detox program that nobody ever thought was connected to vitamin A toxicity or other deficiencies fix. Stuff that I haven't even looked up research on yet fixes itself. Do I need to know if it's myopathy or ata ataxia? No. Not when we know what can cause both. So another quote from Chris. Every time it happens, I adjust a few things and it goes away. The terbinafine also caused severe twitching, which I solved by getting enough potassium and avoiding alcohol and other acids. So I wrote a whole article about how the research shows that vitamin A blocks potassium channels. Twitches can be related to a vitamin A, I'm sorry, a potassium deficiency. Twitches can be related to a potassium deficiency and vitamin A can block potassium channels. Blocking potassium channels in, in the body would basically look like a functional potassium deficiency. You can reduce that symptom by forcing more potassium in to go around the blocks. I used to do this with people before I knew about vitamin A toxicity. I used to, I used to advocate lot, you know, lots of food potassium. Maybe you may have seen my 50-50 salt video here on YouTube. I used to use potassium to help people feel better. It would help them feel better. But it wasn't fixing the cause. The cause is the vitamin A toxicity. And if you take vitamin D supplements, I have another paper in rats that showed that vitamin D supplements caused potassium wasting, an excess loss of potassium from those rats. So vitamin D supplements cause you to lose potassium. Vitamin A causes you to block potassium channels. And both of them end up looking like potassium deficiency. So reducing the symptom of twitching by getting more potassium, it helps the symptom, yes. It does nothing for the root cause. Now, is twitching related to thiamine deficiency, B1 deficiency? I'm going to go to Chris Masterjohn's own website to read this next part from you. Quote, Thiamine, or vitamin B1, is central to both energy metabolism and antioxidant defense. While its deficiency causes many problems, out of all the B vitamins, its deficiency is most neurological in nature because energy metabolism of the brain becomes severely compromised and because neurotransmitters derived from protein cannot be produced. In its most severe form, berry berry, it can cause loss of muscle control twitching, muscles freezing into awkward positions, and seizures. End quote. Loss of muscle control, like ataxia? Twitching? It's really interesting, right? Funny how these things keep coming back up again and again. And if you'll recall from above what we already talked about, Alcohol depletes thiamine. This is well known. The first thing that doctors are going to look at in a known alcoholic is B1 deficiency. It's interesting that avoiding alcohol helped resolve his symptoms for a while, right? Hmm. So what about, vitamin, what about alcohol and vitamin A toxicity? Do those interact? <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. From the paper, alcohol, vitamin A, and beta carotene, adverse reaction interactions, including hepatotoxicity 
and carcinogenicity. Quote, it is, however, complicated by the intrinsic hepatotoxicity of retinol, which is potentiated by concomitant alcohol consumption. By contrast, beta carotene, a precursor of vitamin A, was considered innocuous until recently, when it was found to also interact with ethanol, which interferes with its conversion to retinol. Furthermore, the combination of beta carotene with ethanol results in hepatotoxicity, end quote. Alcohol enhances the toxicity of retinol and beta carotene, you say? Hmm? It's almost like all of these things are connected, right? No coincidences. Next quote from Chris. As it subsided, it settled into a fuzzy paresthesia in my cheeks that got better and better over time, end quote. Can we connect paresthesia, which is a burning or prickling sensation, to thiamine deficiency? Here's a paper called Nutritional Neuropathies. Quote, clinical features of thiamine deficiency begin with distal sensory loss, burning pain, paresthesias, or muscle weakness in the toes and feet. Well, there's muscle weakness myopathy showing up again along with paresthesias and thiamine deficiency. Next quote from Chris, quote, the last bout of twitching is highly effectively managed with strategies targeting acid-base balance and glutamate, currently emphasizing beta alanine and B6, end quote. I mean, just, this is just a philosophical thing here. Managing symptoms is not what I do. I am after the root cause. Next quote from Chris. The gait issue seemed to resolve in response to ensuring adequate B vitamins across the board end quote. So it seemed to resolve in, in response to ensuring adequate B vitamins across the board. How in the world? Think about this for a second. I was quoting above this nutritional experts suggestions for the ideal diet and his own diet in which he was supplementing oyster extract and liver pills and nutritional yeast at every meal, according to what he said. How in the world does this person show up with severe B vitamin deficiency symptoms? You need to ask yourself that question. Remember what I said earlier, the toxicity always wins in the end. So let's cover things that deplete B vitamins that are involved in several of the recurring themes we've been over, okay? I'm not passing judgment here. I'm trying to find the solution to this problem and to show you that there are solutions to these problems. Avoiding alcohol relieved his symptoms previously. If you look at Chris's Facebook page, you will see that alcohol is mentioned several times and pictures of him holding beers is done at least several times in the last month of his posts that I looked through. I just looked through maybe, um, maybe not even a month of posts. If you go back within a couple of weeks, you can find several posts where he is holding a beer and talking about things like four drinks in a night. I'm not passing judgment. I used to consume alcohol as, as over the years as I figured out just how detrimental alcohol is to human health in all ways, I don't drink anymore. It was purely a health decision I made that for and with what I learned about it like alcohol worsening vitamin A toxicity. 
So what B vitamin deficiencies have been associated in the research with the consumption of alcohol? The connections are fairly clear. I have a paper here linked that shows alcohol consumption is associated with lower thiamine B1, pyridoxal phosphate, which is B6, and folate B9. I have another link showing that alcohol consumption is associated with lower riboflavin B2. I have another paper showing that alcohol consumption is associated with lower niacin B3. So now we've covered B1, B2, B3, B6, and B9. One that we're missing is B12, right? Here's a fun one. Remember how part of any and all of the vitamin A that you eat, we talked about this earlier, is turned into 13 cis retinoic acid, aka isotretinoin, aka Accutane. This is scientific fact. It has been demonstrated in multiple case studies that 13 cis retinoic acid taken in a pill called Accutane is extremely effective at depleting both vitamin B12 and folate. Hey, what nutrients does the MTHFR crowd love to talk on and on and on about deficiencies? Folate and B12, is it? Oh yeah, vitamin A toxicity affects methylation too. So yeah, maybe you don't have a folate and B12 deficiency necessarily in your diet. Maybe it's just the vitamin A toxicity. So we can there infer if vitamin A toxicity, if too much vitamin A in your intake, your diet would result in too much 13 cis retinoic acid, that then that would deplete B12 and folate. So now we have B1, B2, B3, B6, B9, and B12. And it responded to ensuring adequate B vitamins across the board, you say. Okay. Now, I need to say something here because this is an important connection. Alcohol is, so ethanol is alcohol. So if I say ethanol now, I mean what most people drink as alcohol, okay? You don't want to drink methanol. Don't do that. Ethanol is alcohol. And retinol, boy, those sound familiar, right? Ethanol, retinol. Ethanol is an alcohol, and retinol is an alcohol, okay? They go through the exact same detox pathways to leave the body, to be turned into hopefully less toxic things so you can get rid of them. Ethanol first goes through an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which turns it into acetaldehyde or acetaldehyde, which acetaldehyde then goes through another enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, which then turns it into acetic acid. Acetic acid being what's in low concentrations in vinegar, much less toxic than alcohol or acetaldehyde, okay? What happens with retinol? Retinol goes through the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. It's turned into retinaldehyde. So maybe you didn't know that one of the forms of vitamin A is actually an aldehyde. Sometimes they call it retinal with an A to hide that it's an aldehyde. They're trying to hide the toxicity of this from you in research, okay? Retinaldehyde then goes through aldehyde dehydrogenase and it is turned into retinoic acid. Remember how we talked about 13 cis retinoic acid and all trans retinoic acid? That is, they use the same detox pathway, okay? So an alcoholic, a person, well, let me put it this way. A person who's consuming alcohol is going to use these pathways to detox the alcohol. And these pathways in the research are shown to use more of certain nutrients. B1, B2, B3 are some very important ones that it uses up. And it uses up some minerals too. That's not what I'm going to go over here today. So if processing an excessive amount of alcohol uses up an excessive amount of certain nutrients, so then they, they result in deficiency. If retinol and retinaldehyde use the exact same detox pathways that deplete certain nutrients, could it not be assumed that the exact same deficiencies that alcohol causes, ethanol causes, would be the same deficiencies that vitamin A could cause, retinol and retinaldehyde? 
I'm going to say it is quite possible and quite likely. We already know that from earlier alcohol depleted folate and B12, and for alcohol depleted folate, and we know that ret 13 cis retinoic acid accutane depletes B12 and folate. So there's, they're already connected. And I can tell you that people who have vitamin A toxicity are responding really well to specific B vitamins. I do not do B complexes. Some of the research on long-term dosing, high dosing of B vitamins coming out, B6, folate, B12 is not looking good. Not interested in a B complex. So just so you know, in some of the research, if you start going and looking and saying, well, wait, Dr. Smith, it says here retinol goes through retinol dehydrogenase and retinaldehyde goes through retinaldehyde dehydrogenase. They're just trying to confuse you again because retinol dehydrogenase is exactly the same thing as alcohol dehydrogenase. They just gave it another name and retinaldehyde dehydrogenase is exactly the same thing as aldehyde dehydrogenase. They just gave it a different name. It'd be like a nickname because they normally talk in alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. But in certain studies, they decide to try to confuse people by changing the name. There is no difference, okay? So we know now, well, there's the assumption that potentially the same nutrient deficiencies that alcohol causes, ethanol causes, could also be vitamin deficiencies that vitamin A toxicity could cause. We know that alcohol, ethanol, and vitamin A are synergistically toxic to the liver. Could this be why these heroic efforts at B vitamin supplementation are necessary to keep the problem at bay? And like I said, the toxicity will always win in the end. So that covers the B vitamin issue. Next quote from Chris. By the time I went to the neurologist, the gait issue was 95% gone. So it's still there. The toxicity always wins. But she thought me having a witness to the leg dragging compelling enough to do an MRI and EMG. If I find anything interesting, I'll be using it to probe whether I have any genetics that could offer a unified explanation for why veganism and terbinafine both seem to have caused neurological problems for me. So that means there have been neurological problems in the past from veganism that were not mentioned. In, I'm sorry, I didn't end the quote. For me, end quote. There's been neurological problems in the past then. This is, neurological problems are not new for Chris, is what he just said. The gait thing is not his first neurological issue. This is not a genetic problem. People are trying to use genetics as a way to scapegoat themselves of responsibility. Some of the best and brightest minds in the world are doing this. This is not genetics. Do genetics play a role? Genetics loads the gun. Environment pulls the trigger. Hear that again. Genetics loads the gun. Environment pulls the trigger. Diet is environment. Toxicity is environment. Did I not show you enough examples of those environment problems in this so far? But why did veganism cause him a problem before? A neurological problem that I have not looked for or discussed yet because I didn't go that far into his Facebook past. Why veganism? Because veganism is a diet particularly suited to causing vitamin A toxicity. Vegan diets are particularly prone to be excessive or deficient in very specific things, any of or all of which often help lead the way to vitamin A toxicity. Some of these things include a vegan diet is excessively high in carotenoids generally. Remember that he had a problem with butternut squash earlier. They are, vegan diets are deficient in zinc and excessively high in copper. A vegan diet is completely lacking in the amino acid taurine. Amino, the amino acid taurine is only found in muscle meat and 
possibly organ meats, but we don't want to do those. It is not found in eggs or dairy. Regardless of what you read people repeating on the internet, you go and you look at the research, there's no taurine in eggs or dairy. There's just people saying it on the internet. A vegan diet is often completely lacking in protein. You need protein to make what's called retinol binding protein, which from Grant Jenneru's work is probably simply an antibody that binds to vitamin A to protect you from vitamin A. And if you don't have enough protein, you can't make retinol binding protein. And this is in the research too. And a vegan diet is often lacking in total calories. Some of the vitamin A toxicity studies from back in the 1940s and 1950s, wait, what? This was happening back then too? Oh my gosh. Were they probably supplementing lots of vitamin A back then? No. You want to know who vitamin A toxicity was happening to back in the 40s and 50s? It was people taking cod liver oil, generally, or vegans and vegetarians. And you want to know what one of the things the doctors did to those vegan and vegetarians to fix them? They put them on a high calorie diet that was low in vitamin A. Vegan diets are particularly suited for a lack of calories. So, listed out five problems as to why a vegan diet could have caused neurological problems related to vitamin A toxicity and B vitamin deficiencies. And then if alcohol was layered on top of that, boy, you're in a, that's a not a good combo. Another quote from Chris, notably, my cholesterol is always low, currently 140 to 160, veganism slashed it to 106, and terbinafine works by inhibiting fungal sterol synthesis and is 60% active against human cholesterol synthesis. When I have more info, I'll keep you up to date, end quote. There's nothing I wanna cover in that last bit. So back to the anxiety issues that I mentioned at the start of this post. Now, Anxiety in any medical situation is totally normal. You've heard of white coat syndrome. I mean, nobody likes going to the doctor because if you're going to the doctor, there's a problem. Anxiety is normal in that situation. But when we look at the whole picture, are there other connections that we can make? Why do many people drink alcohol? Isn't it to relax? Take the edge off? So, is anxiety related? to vitamin A toxicity. From the paper, vitamin A and retinoids as mitochondrial toxicants. For all of you who are interested in the mitochondria and thinking that's everything. For those of you who are into mitochondria and you think the mitochondria are everything, listen to the title of that paper again. Vitamin A and retinoids as mitochondrial toxicants. Quote, really, a panoply of side effects has been observed that result from vitamin A intoxication that varies from acute intoxication, including, for example, headache, hepatic swelling, vomiting, and diarrhea to chronic intoxication with induction of cognitive decline in subjects at different ages, as observed in the cases of increased irritability, confusion, anxiety disorders, depression, and suicidal ideation. The exact mechanism by which vitamin A and retinoids exert such effects is not yet clear. However, it may include cell cycle disarrangement, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative and nitrosative stress induction, and activation of cell death signaling in different experimental models. And, end quote. After that, I, I link another paper showing that anxiety is also a symptom of vitamin A toxicity. So, in conclusion, what did we do here? I hope I've shown that it's pretty obvious that Chris has a severe and worsening vitamin A toxicity problem, and I hope this helps him to decide to reconsider his views on vitamin A toxicity. Severe B vitamin deficiencies, if you noted in what he was eating, the liver pills, the yeast, these things, oyster extract, he's trying to supplement B vitamins heavily. The problem is, is he's getting vitamin A and problematic things with all of those B vitamin supplements. And that both of these issues 
while not totally caused by, but they are being exacerbated by continued alcohol consumption. And again, I don't care about alcohol consumption. I don't do it, but is it a real factor in this case? Yes. So the nutrition detective found all the clues, found all the culprits, know what to do now. For those of you who liked this, my website is nutritionrestored.com. I do individual consults with clients all around the world. I think we were at 21 countries last count. Um, I do most of my work via blood testing for nutrients and hair testing for nutrients. We test, we don't guess, and then we address. Next, if you wanted to join my network, I have a little mini social network on Mighty Networks. It is nutrition-restored.mn.co. Again, that's nutrition-restored.mn.co. It's free to join the network. That is where my vitamin A detox program can be found. Um, that's where my program on biofeedback can be found. Other things are going to be made available soon. So if you like what, what you're hearing, feel free to join me at either of those places and have a great day. I hope you learned something. That's all I'm here trying to do is to help people and help people learn why certain things make them feel bad and why certain things make them feel good. Have a great day. See you later.